All right. So today um, we're skipping out of the web-based things and we're actually getting into the real part of the class. Um, before we can get started in Photoshop, we need to learn how to take photos. And so the two go hand in hand. Um, I spend a little bit of time going through kind of the nitty-gritty details of photography. Certainly, if it's something that's interesting to you, you could take a whole semester-long class in photography. I mean, you could even major in some places in photography. So it's a much bigger topic than I can possibly talk about in one lecture. However, I think if I give you enough um, of an understanding of some of the key settings and some of the key things that you might want to consider, you may have a little bit better appreciation. My goal is not to make you... Uh, an expert professional photographer today. My goal is for you to switch from auto mode on your camera to one of the presets. <laughs> so it's a very small goal, but we're trying to get there. Um, the, the interesting thing about the world of photography is it's changed an awful lot um, in the last 10 years. So we went from film to digital, and now we're going from fancy digital cameras to pretty much everybody just relies on their phone. Uh, and I see this in my life, um, you know, my wife used to have a camera. Now she relies 100% on her iPhone, and all of her pictures get posted to Instagram, and that's kind of the world of photography as she sees it, right? And we, we don't end up taking the big fancy photos anymore. And it's just it's kind of interesting how things are changing. Doesn't mean that we can't talk about it and, and explore it. So let's start first with the definition of terms so that when I talk about, say, aperture, you understand what on earth I'm talking about. Um, the first thing is the camera body itself. And the body is basically a light-proof box. And in the real old days when we had film, it was, in fact, a light-proof box that had a little tiny hole that let light in. Um, and so we, we, we have these cameras now. Um, they get smaller and smaller. This one is a big camera body. And, you know, how many people have been to a wedding where there's a wedding photographer running around? Right? A lot of people tend to have been to something like that. They have a big bulky camera with big lenses and all that stuff. This is the, the extreme example of that. It's basically, it's a box uh, with some stuff inside it. Um, if we think about your phone, your phone is essentially a box with some stuff inside it. It's just really thin right, and really small. But this concept is still the same. Right? Um, the light-sensitive material that's in this box um, for digital cameras is an actual sensor. In the old days, it was a piece of film. Um, my guess is that there are a large number of you who have never even seen a piece of film. Uh, and so it's just kind of interesting, right? Aperture is a key term, something that we'll talk a lot about in this class because it affects a photo in a, in a pretty dramatic way and, it, and in a pretty artistic way. So basically what aperture is, is it's the size of the opening that's letting the light come through and ultimately hit the light-sensitive material, so the, the sensor in the camera. And so the size of this circular opening, right, determines how much light can come into the camera and touch that sensor. Uh, and so this is an example of a camera lens um, in a blown up sense, which will help us see, right? So you see this little white dot in the center here, right? That's an aperture. It's a very small aperture that's letting light in. This is the same lens, right, but with a very large aperture, which a lot of light comes in. And so you guys say, okay, what does that mean for me? And the basic translation of what it can do is it, it translates into something called depth of field. And you've probably seen this in photographs before, where you have something in the foreground that's really sharp, and then the background is kind of just blurry colors. Right? This is when the aperture is really large. Right? When you're letting a lot of light in, you get this kind of blurred background. Crisp image in front, blurred background behind. The difficult part about aperture is it's represented by something called f-stop. An f-stop is the opposite, right? So the smaller the f-stop number, so if you have an f1.4, for example, it means it's really big, right? And if you have a high f-stop, so uh, an 8, an f8, or an f16, or an f32, something like that. Sounds like fighter planes, but it's not, right? If you have something like that, it means it's really small. So it's this weird inverse relationship. It's a little hard to, to get your head around. But ultimately, what matters is the bigger the opening, the bigger the aperture, the more blurry background you get. Right? And so this can really affect what a photo looks like. So here's an example here. Uh, this is an f1.8, so really big, right? For 1 60th of a second, we'll talk about shutter speed uh, in just a second. Um, and you see that just a little bit of the flower right, is in focus. If we go slightly behind, it goes blurry really fast. Right? So because that aperture is so large, we have very thin depth of field. So just a little bit of the image is in focus. 
right? If we were taking a picture of a landscape, for example, right? So we move from this that has very fine depth of field, picture of California coast, right? And F8, so a much smaller hole, much smaller aperture, right? Because it's a landscape, we want the stuff in the front to be in focus. And I know we're projecting, so you can barely tell, but it is, trust me. Right? The stuff in front is in focus, the stuff in the middle is in focus, and the stuff far away is in focus. So depending on what we're trying to shoot, right, we're going to vary this, this, this um, aperture. Okay? Shutter speed is another variable. So we already talked about aperture as being a primary variable. The other one is shutter speed. Uh, this one's pretty easy to understand, right? It's the amount of time the camera lens is open to receive light. So the faster that is, right, the, the shorter the amount of time is. So let's say we were out shooting um, sports, right? We were out on the football field watching people play. We wanted to freeze, right? We were taking pictures for a newspaper article or something like that. We wanted to see everything but just in frozen. We would want a really fast shutter speed because things are moving, right? Alternatively, maybe we wanted to take a picture of a waterfall in Yosemite, right? And we wanted it to be all blurry and we wanted to see this, like, this wispy view, right? That would be the opposite. We'd have a long shutter speed. Let's say we wanted to take a picture at night. There's not a lot of light. We'd have a really long shutter speed, right, to allow enough light to come into this camera. So we're going to vary this as well. Typical exposure is about 125th of a second. So we're talking really fast, right? Generally speaking, a person can hold a camera still to about 1 60th of a second or so, right? Depends on how steady your hands are. I can do about 1 50th of a second when I'm shooting, right? Otherwise, you're going to blur it. So you have to learn what that value is for you. Some people shake a little bit more. You have to be a little bit faster. This is totally out of order. Sorry. And it shouldn't say depth of field. Anyway, um, so here's a... Uh, let me go forward. Yeah, weird. Ignore the heading. That's my fault. Okay, so this is 1 50th of a second, right? So it's not too fast, but if we look at it, we can still see individual drops of water, right? If we jump forward, right, this is 1 10th of a second, you can see how the individual drops are now starting to be streaks, right? So what was a drop is now moving a little bit. It's blurring when you take that photo. If we jump forward, we can still see the ripples, the little waves in the pool, though, okay? If we jump forward another one to a half second, you can see that this is getting much more blurred, right? And we're also seeing much more smoothing in the little ripples at the bottom of the pool. If we jump forward again to one second, right? This is very, very smooth. So you can see how this really changes the photo, right? So the shutter speed. The thing we have to be careful of is now we're starting to get up here. We don't get any detail anymore because the shutter speed's so long and so much light is coming in off those rocks. So we're going to lose the detail up above. Okay. ISO is the third variable, really not too relevant anymore um, because uh, our, our digital cameras are such that they, they can filter out a lot of the noise. ISO is a holdover from the old days of a camera when you used to buy film and you'd buy film at a certain film speed. You'd buy ISO 100 film and you'd go out and shoot. If you wanted to shoot sports photography, you'd buy ISO 800. Right? just has to do with how sensitive the material is. So in the digital world, we just adjust how sensitive the sensor is. Right? So it doesn't really involve anything too special uh, to do it. But what happens is you can end up getting noise. Anybody take a picture that looked like this? Right? Where you get all the little speckles and stuff? That's because you're shooting in low light. You didn't have a sufficient flash right? or sufficient lighting in the scene. And your camera just, it, it, it bumped up the ISO to be able to expose the picture, but it got a bunch of noise in the way, a bunch of speckles and stuff that, that you didn't really want to have, okay? The better the camera, the higher the ISO you can shoot without the noise. So this is an ISO of 1600, which is pretty high, but we're not getting those speckles. So it depends on what camera you have and how far it can go uh, in low light, right? If you were going out and shopping for a camera, this would be something you'd want to pay attention to. Uh, White balance is really only something that happens in the world of digital cameras, and it basically means that if you, have a, if you take a picture, the color might be skewed one direction or the other. The easiest way to, to uh, show this is to actually show an example. Anybody ever had this happen? Right? You took a picture, and it looks like maybe it's underwater because right? it's all blue. The colors are just wrong. This is a white balance issue. So it says it's thinking that white is more blue than it really is in the photo. Uh, and so in this example, we have a photo of Times Square in New York, right? Too blue, 
in the white balance, it's skewed the wrong direction, this is the correct exposure for it. And the good news is it's a really easy adjustment after the fact in Photoshop. So if you took your picture and it ended up like this, very easy to switch it. Right? Bracketing is something that's done when we get to high dynamic range photography primarily. We'll talk at length about what high HDR photos are and where we would use them. Um, but for the meantime, because we're talking about the technicalities of photography, I have to talk about it. Basically what it means, and a lot of cameras will do this automatically, is in, you'll take one photo that is what you think the correct exposure is, and then you'll take a photo that's deliberately overexposed, right, a little bit lighter, and you'll take a photo that's deliberately underexposed, right? And the world of HDR photography merges those three photos to give you together to give you a high dynamic range image, right? It's usually three, five, or seven photos. Right? So this is a high dynamic range image. Anybody ever try to take a picture of a sunset and never had it, you know, had to look at it afterwards and be like, wow, the sunset is a lot more beautiful in person than in the photo. Anybody done that before? Right? It's because our eyes can adjust and see better high dynamic range than a camera can. And so if you were taking a picture of a sunset, you wanted it to look really good, right? Really, in an ideal sense, you'd want to shoot like this, where you have three images that ultimately get combined into one image. So you get that dynamic range. So these are just examples of, of high dynamic range images. And we'll, we'll talk at length about that. So aperture and shutter speed have an inverse relationship. So if we wanted the same exposure on a camera, uh, we'd have to decrease the shutter speed by half uh, to compensate for two times the aperture. Right? So if the aperture gets bigger, right, we have to decrease the shutter speed. More light comes in the camera, shutter speed has to go down. Right? So they have that relationship. If we were... Professional photographers, we could go through something like this and understand what an exposure value is. I show you this just for information. I'm not expecting you to suddenly do this, right, or 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 memorize these kinds of tables. But it's important to kind of understand um, what we can do in this kind of a chart. And this is if you were if you were in a photography class and they were saying you're going to learn to shoot manual, right, or something like that, you'd have to learn this. So what you do is you'd say, okay. I need to take a, a picture of a night scene uh, and window displays in the night scene. I want an exposure value of 7 to 8. And then you'd go back to oops, this chart. You'd say my exposure value needs to be 7 or 8, right? And it'll tell you based on your aperture, right, starting at 1.0 going across, how long the exposure needs to be, right? So if you jumped over here to uh, you wanted a, an aperture of 8, an f-stop of eight, you'd be at a quarter to an eighth of a second in exposure. So you see how this all works. It's a chart that lets you follow through what, what would be the proper exposure, right? A lot of cameras will do this automatically, but I at least like to tell you that there is some math and some, you, if you really wanted to learn this, you could. This is just a chart that kind of combines it all together. Um, so the other thing that is important, and I think this is probably more valuable for um, uh, people that are shooting in a point and shoot, strategy is something called exposure compensation and you may have seen this on your camera if you have an iPhone and you tap the center of the screen when you're taking a picture and you drag your finger up or down that's what you're adjusting is this exposure compensation uh, basically what you're doing is you're saying if I have even light the exposure is zero or the exposure compensation is zero it's what the camera thinks is the correct exposure right if you want it to be deliberately lighter or deliberately darker right you can go one direction or the other so if you go in the negative direction, the photo is going to get darker as a whole. If you go in the positive direction, it's going to get a little bit lighter. Right? And there's usually an easy option to find on your camera to deliberately make it do this. If you want to search through your particular camera today, I'm happy to sit with you and we'll find where this value is. Okay. Quick note on lighting in general, uh, and I think this is an important distinction. Um, those of you that are designers are going to uh, you know, start to understand this. Um, I was in uh, Peru on a field school. I was teaching in a field school. And it was a combination of architecture people and archaeology people. And um, we would go out to this site, um, which was not the most spectacular site. It was a mud site, not one of the big stone sites. Um, and we would go there every day, and we'd spend from you know 7 in the morning until 7 at night. And all of the architecture people, when we first got to the site and right before we were leaving, were running around taking photos because the light was very dramatic. Right? The light was coming in as an angle, it was slightly orange in color, and it really accentuated the architecture. We could see what these mud buildings look like, etc. Right? In the middle of the day, we were all completely bored and didn't really want to do anything because it was ugly. Right? They were just mud buildings. 
The opposite was true for the archaeologists. They were all excited at noon because it was the most even light they could possibly get. Right? There wasn't any skew, there wasn't any shadow, and they could photograph the painting on the wall or whatever that they wanted to photograph. Completely different purpose. So if you're looking for something with a little bit more drama, um, accentuating shadows and that sort of thing, you're going to be shooting at the extreme ends of the day. If you want something that's very even light because you're shooting for a technical purpose of trying to analyze something, you're going to want to be shooting in the middle of the day. So it's really important to decide what you're trying to do right, and then adjust your timing and schedule accordingly. So there's a variety of file types that come out of cameras. The most common is something called a JPEG. Uh, you're probably familiar with JPEGs. Um, it's, it technically stands for the Joint Photographic Experts Group, right, not that anybody cares about that anymore, right. Uh, it's the most common file type. It, what it does is it, it's kind of like an MP3 where it strips out stuff that you can't hear. In the, in the world of a, a JPEG, it strips out the stuff that you can't see. Right? So if you have more detail than you need, it strips that out, makes the file size smaller, which makes it really convenient for storing on a little SD card. Right? Um, typically, the images are compressed about 10 to 1. So if the original si file size was 16 gigabytes, a JPEG would be about 1.6. Right? Or 15, uh, 16 megabytes would be about 1.6 megabytes. A TIFF is uh, another type of file, sometimes comes out of cameras. It's considered to be a lossless, which means you're not throwing away any information in the photo. You're not getting rid of it, but it does have some compression uh, associated with it. So it's a little bit smaller. can be okay. right? A raw file is the best coming out of a digital camera. If you have a phone, chances are they don't shoot in RAW. But if you have another camera, chances are it does shoot in RAW, right? certainly in this day and age. And what, what a raw image does is it's the equivalent of a digital negative. And it says this is every piece of information the camera captured when you shot this particular image. And so you can make some corrections like I messed up on the exposure and I want to change the exposure after the fact. Because it's a raw image and it captured more data, you can make these kinds of adjustments over time, which is really, really good. I think the easiest way to see this is to, to show an example. Okay? So let's say I went out and I shot this picture of a barn, uh, which I did. And if I had a JPEG file right, that came out of my camera, it would look something like this, and it was overexposed. Right? And then I said, ah, I, didn't, I wasn't really happy with that. I wanted the detail. Uh, let me go into Photoshop and try to correct it. Right? So I did my best to try to correct it, and this is about as good as I could get with the JPEG. Okay? If, however, I shot with RAW, right? this is the same overexposed image, right? and I went back and post-processed the RAW image, you see that I got all of this detail back in the paint, okay? which I couldn't get in the JPEG because it was overexposed. So in a JPEG, if you have something that's just white, you're not going to get any detail back from it if you try to do some post-processing. If you have a raw image that was originally white, right, you can get all of the detail back from it. So there's value to it. Um, the, 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 the downside of it is the space that it takes. right? So you're capturing the full size of the image. The 1.6 megabyte JPEG image is now 16 megabytes as a raw image. So you're, you're sacrificing space. So let's talk a little bit about your camera. Um, this is in a, in a larger size, uh, but this is essentially the sensor that's inside your camera. Right? If you have a phone, this sensor is really, really tiny. Right? If you have a digital camera, chances are it's a little bit bigger, more along this side. And what it is basically is it's a sensor right, that has an array of red, green, and blue little squares on it. And if the light comes through right, and shines through one of those squares, it will say, yes, this is green light, this is blue light, or this is red light, or some combination of the three. Right? That then translates into a bunch of ones and zeros, which is the digital image itself, right? which we can see here, gets stored on a card, comes out, and we can then work with it. Okay? So if you have your typical compact camera, right? these are becoming few and far between. I need to update this slide with a picture of your phone because it's more likely to be the actual case. Uh, basically, uh, you have you know, some kind of a zoom trigger, you have a lens that pops out, and you have a screen on the back. Right? If you have a digital SLR camera, uh, it's similar, just a little bit bulkier. The advantages of a digital, a digital SLR camera um, is basically that you can switch out lenses and you can get better quality lenses to go on it. Generally speaking, an SLR camera is going to have significantly better optics than your phone. right? And if you think about the lens that's on one of these versus the tiny little lens that's on your phone, it's not really a surprise. 
right? So the camera modes are something that's important. And this is, if, if I can inspire you to do one thing, it's that you should switch your camera modes, right? Typically, everybody's mode is set on auto and they never touch it, right? But if you think a little bit about what you're trying to do, you can make a difference. So uh, let's skip through the first video mode and the macro close-up mode, which is the flower or vine. We'll skip through night mode, which is obviously to take pictures at night. And let's go to portrait mode, which is the first one. Okay, so the idea behind a portrait mode is that you're trying to blur out the background, right, but keep the foreground in focus. So it's essentially saying, give me a, a, a low f-stop, right, a low aperture, so it's a really big, right, and blur out the background of whatever I'm trying to take. So it doesn't mean that you have to take a picture of a person. It just means that when you take a picture and you want the background to be blurry, switch to the portrait mode. Right? The inverse is true with landscape mode, if you have something like that. It means I want everything to be in focus, nothing in blurry in the background. So if you switch to that mode, you're going to get better results. Right? In sports mode is freeze the action. No long exposures. I want a quick Right? So if you were taking a picture of a waterfall and you wanted all the individual droplets, you'd be in sports mode. Right? This is a lot better to switch between these modes than to just rely on auto, right? which is what most people do. So I'm, I'm really encouraging you. As you get down further, there might be a panorama mode that lets you stitch images together, which can be kind of fun. And then there's usually some semi-programmed modes. Right? So an aperture priority mode might mean I set the aperture at what I want, but the rest of the camera you know, figures out everything else from shutter speed on down. Right? If it's a shutter speed priority, it might be an S, it might be a T on the camera dial. Uh, that means that I set the shutter, shutter speed and it determines everything else in the camera. These are kind of amateur, you know, professional amateur modes. Right? And then we can get all the way down to full manual, which even I don't shoot in full manual because it's way too much work to calculate it all out. Okay? So the point is, try to play around with those. Okay? So if you're going to think about going out on a photo shoot, right, you want to think about what, what, how am I going to get set up to do this. So the first thing is how big is your card. So let's say you're going on vacation and you, you know you take a certain number of pictures on vacation typically. Do you, is your card big enough to accommodate those pictures? Do you need to get a new card? Do you need to take images off your card that you haven't taken off before? Those kinds of things. right? Um, and ultimately, what's your final output? Okay. I used to make people get out all their cameras, but we're not going to go through that today. Um, we can go that, through that afterward. Um, generally speaking, you want to shoot in as high a resolution as you can. Right? If you can shoot in RAW, shoot in RAW. Right? Storage space is really cheap now. It used to be really expensive. Now it's super cheap. No big deal. Shoot in RAW. Okay? Or at least shoot in the highest end um, JPEG. So you're in the highest size. So if you're going to carry around a camera bag, right? let's say you're going on a, on a backpacking trip in Peru and you want to be able to take pictures the whole time that you're there, you want to think about the stuff that you might need. right? If you're in a dusty environment, you want to think about having some kind of lens cleaner to clean it. Um, if you're even with your phone, every once in a while it's not a bad idea to clean the lens off your phone because it sits in your pocket and gets stuff glued on it and you know your daughter picks it up and you know puts food all over it, whatever. right? Um, you might want to have an extra memory card. Maybe you want to have a tripod because you want to take some remote shots or you want nice steady shots. Uh, if you have a SLR, maybe you're bringing extra lenses along with you. right? And so you can see this camera bag is getting bigger or smaller depending on what it is that you're trying to do. right? You also want to think about are you allowed to photograph particular subjects. right? Sometimes there's restrictions on taking pictures. Sometimes there aren't. You want to be aware of that. Uh, and you want to take a look at the weather. right? That's one of the big things. So it will rain. So we went up to Machu Picchu on this trip, which was fantastic. And of course, it was an absolute pouring rain day. right? Uh, so we ended up <laughs> wearing ponchos and having backpacks and, and that sort of thing. My camera bag has a, has a weatherproof seal that will fold out of the bottom and cover it up so that I can be protected. But you want to be aware that this kind of stuff can happen because it will rain. Right? Turned out that this trip, it rained the whole time. The whole hike was, this was, um, we were hiking up to the sun gate at Machu Picchu. Um, pouring rain the whole time. That was just the trip. We got to the very top. Anybody been to Machu Picchu before? A couple of you. Did you go up through the Sun Gate or did you go up through the buses? Bus? The what? You did go through the Sun Gate. The hike? We only did a day hike. You can do it for four days and go the whole Inca Trail. Um, we did the, the, the one day, I think it started at like five in the morning and it was just the last leg of the hike. Uh, 
so when you get to Machu Picchu, you've, you've all seen pictures. You guys know what Machu Picchu is, maybe? Okay. You've seen the pictures, and it's pretty cool, right? doesn't hold a candle to what it is in person. It's unbelievable in person. So anyway, we were there. We're going up to the sun gate. And as you're hiking along, you're hiking along this trail. And then suddenly the, the trail takes a left turn. And you, you come around that left turn. And there's this staircase that goes forever. right? Or it seems like it goes forever. And you start going up the staircase. So anyway, we were doing this. And it was pouring rain and whatever. And we got to the top of the sun gate. And the clouds parted. And it was like the aura came down. I mean, it was absolutely breathtakingly incredible. And then it started raining again. But it was just, it was this really cool arrival. It was how you were supposed to arrive in Machu Picchu. Um, totally worth it. If you're ever in Peru, you have to go and you have to do the Inca Trail because it was just awesome. So anyway, but yes, it will rain. So let's talk a little bit about composition techniques. And if there's one thing that you can do to improve your photos, it's to think about how you compose your photos, right? The natural thing is to take whatever it is that you're trying to take a photo of and put it right smack in the center of your photo, right? And chances are that's not the best composition that you can use. So these kinds of compositional techniques work for the world of photography, but they work for, you know, graphic design layouts. When you're doing a poster, uh, all of these kinds of things feed back on themselves. So I'm going to go through a variety of strategies here. Um, I'll end with the most important one, but we'll go through a couple of other ones. So first one is telling a story. Right? And that means that something in the image is causing the person viewing the image to get into it, to follow through something that's in the story. Right? So it doesn't have to be a literal story, right? a fairy tale or something. It just means that there's something. There's a path. There's a road. There's something that the person viewing the photo can get involved in or, and be interested in. Okay? It may allow you to navigate through. It may have to do with lighting conditions or whatever. So this is St. Peter's. Not the best picture in the world, but it captures the light coming through this window and the fact that the people were congregating right at the light. Right? So it's telling a bit of a story about what it was like to be in that building. Right? This is Snag Platt in uh, the Swiss Alps. Same concept. Right? You have this trail right, that continues here, works its way through the photo, all the way over here, and ultimately all over there. Right? So if you spend a little bit of time looking at this photo, you can imagine yourself walking on that trail or having just come from that trail. Right? So there's some element that weaves, weaves through. Right? This was in Peru. This was kind of the mood of the Andes uh, when we were doing this with the rain and whatever. Same kind of thing. Right? So let's move to another type. This would be symmetry. Right? The, so the strong symmetry dominates the photograph. The key with using a symmetrical photo is that there's something that's out of place, right? And that always makes the photo a lot more uh, dramatic. So example here, right? The Brooklyn Bridge in New York, um, perfectly symmetrical photo right down the center, right? The, the bridge itself is symmetrical. The cables are symmetrical, all that sort of thing, right? All the people are on the right side, not on the left side. So you get this really interesting photo because there's some element that's not symmetrical and it draws your attention to the non-symmetrical element. Does that make sense? Right? So when you're thinking symmetry, you want to you wanna be thinking about that. Another example here, right? the couch, the room, everything's symmetrical except for the pile of dust in the corner. Right? That's out of place. It's drawing attention to that pile of dust. Right? Radial right, means that you have a strong focal point in the center or strong tension point at the center. Right? And the elements radiate away from that. This one's kind of hard to do. Works well if you have something that is kind of circular in its nature. Uh, so this was in an ice cave in Switzerland. Um, you've got this strong tension point between the two points that have been melting away, right? kind of a, as a focal point uh, of this particular photograph. It works well with vanishing points. Right? So this is inside a subway tunnel where you have a strong vanishing point, and then everything's radiating from that. Right. Another good example, this is a silhouette of a parachute, right, where we have a strong focal point and everything's radiating away from it. Right, another example. Diagonal means that there's some kind of a strong diagonal element that's in the photo that's capturing attention. Okay, so it might be something like this. It works well with perspectives, right, where you have something that's strong. Right? This is the book drop here at DVC. We have strong diagonals in contrast to the straight lines. Right? Strong diagonal here of the train and the trellis. Overlapping layers. Um, this is something that architects really like, uh, or landscape architects really like, where we have a variety of things. One element frames another element that frames another element, uh, and we kind of work our way back. 
This was that site in Peru that I was talking about that was the mud buildings, far less exciting than the stone buildings, right? But uh, it had some of the best preserved paintings from uh, the Inca civilization. Anyway, uh, so you have a door that leads to a wall with a series of windows that leads to another wall. So you're working your way through layers right, in a particular photo. This is just a, uh, an example of what the site looked like. Obviously shot at one end of the day or the other. I can't remember whether this was morning or afternoon, right? So we have the deep shadows in the recesses, right? Not a noon shot. And you can see the orange cone up above where we were working. All right, the rule of thirds. This is the most important rule that you can learn. It's one of the easiest, simplest ones to follow, and 99% of the time you're going to get a much better image out of it, okay? Basically, it says if you had your viewfinder, Alright, we have our some horrible pen. There's my image, right? If I were to divide it like this and divide it like this, right, all of the action should occur along one of these lines. Right there, or there, or there. Right? should never be in the center, or it should never be in any of these squares. Does that make sense? Right, I'll show you a bunch of examples. This will help. Right, but it's really easy to do, and generally you're going to get the best results out of it. Okay? So picture of Empire State Building, or Empire State Building, Statue of Liberty. Brain. Brain's not working. Not enough caffeine. Right? But if we look at it, right, this is exactly on the third. Not exactly, but close. Right? And so we're also framing the direction that she's looking Right, is toward the large side of the image. Her back is facing the small side of the image. Right? It wouldn't work as well if it was the opposite side. There's also a line roughly at a third here. It's a little lower than a third. But the concept is still the same. Right? We have the, everything above this line is sky. Right? So we're focusing on that point. If we move forward, another example here. Right? In the middle of a rainstorm, it's a boat on a lake. Right? This point is roughly at a third. Right? If I move, move one forward, that's roughly at a third. So you see, it's really easy to set up that composition that way. Right? And we're going to keep repeating this. Okay? Another example here, photograph of a person. Okay? The most common way of photographing a person is to put them in the center of the picture. Right? If you put them in the center of the picture, it's kind of blah. You shift them to one side or the other, suddenly there's more to it. Right? So picture here, right? you've got the person sitting there tying a shoe, but notice he's looking off in this direction. Right? So by capturing the image with him at a third, right, and then his eyes at the other third, you're drawn into, I wonder what he's looking at. Right? It's much different than just the person's here looking at me. Okay? This is an example of what not to do. Right? Same photograph, but if I had cropped it this way, right, he's looking off the edge of the page. Right? It still fits the rule of thirds. Right? There he is. Right? And his eyes are right there on the rule of thirds. So it still fits the rule. Right? But because he's looking off the page, we have all this space over here that just doesn't matter. Right? We don't care about that space. So think about it. Just because it follows the rule of thirds doesn't necessarily mean it's a good composition. So think about what direction the person's looking or what, what side of the picture should have the extra space in it. Uh, another, another example here, you could argue that this is a diagonal composition too. Uh, but it still fits on the rule of thirds, so I'm using both of them at the same time, right? Oops. Right, another example here, rule of thirds, right, that image goes. This is also a good example of a really large aperture, small f-stop, background's all blurred, coconut by itself is in focus, okay? I don't know why I put that line there, okay? Here's an example, right? This is again up in Peru um, when we're hiking, okay? We could very easily have taken this photo, right? Obviously, I didn't take the photo. I'm in it. But we could very easily have taken this photo where we put the two of us in the center of the image, right? But it's a lot more exciting to have the two of us on that third line, right? And to see all of this distance and mountain that we had hiked, right? It's a much more dynamic, interesting photo. So you just want to be very careful about how you compose these images, right? Another example here just a pure landscape, right? It's balanced. We've got a third of the land, two thirds of the ocean, right? Each wing of this uh, little bay accentuates one of the third lines, right? So we have the lower half and the upper half. So we're really using this as our primary compositional technique. 
So if we move forward into framing, uh, this should be relatively obvious. It just means that you have some element that's in the foreground that frames an element that's in the background. Right? For example, in Pompeii, right, we have a window. We're looking through the stone window, and we're seeing Pompeii as a whole. There's our frame. Right? Patterns and repetition are also great. Um, the key is to identify what the pattern is and what breaks the pattern. So just like with the symmetry solution, you need some piece that doesn't fit. Right? One of these things doesn't belong. Remember that from Sesame Street or whatever? Right? You have to find that. Right? So something like this. Completely pattern, right? It's kind of a cool image. There's one thing that doesn't belong. It's the swimsuit hanging on the rail, right? So you want to think about what is it that doesn't fit, right? And how do you highlight that piece that doesn't fit, right? Same thing here. We've got the symmetry. We've got the repetition. And then we have the person walking through. It's the one thing that doesn't fit, right? Symmetry, the snow is the part that's the dynamic element of this particular image, okay? So uh, we're going to stop with the lecture, and I'm going to turn you loose, and I want to go through what uh, we're talking about.